is Veronica Coons with the Great Bend Tribune. On Monday evening, June 23rd, Ken Ross came to the Barton County Historical Museum to give a talk about his time serving as an escort guard in the Nuremberg Trials in Germany back in 1945 and 1946. See all of you here. I know uh, Kansas guy. Grew up in southwest Kansas, lived on a farm, and I credit my dad with saving my life. Because one day, I'd already had one physical for the Army, and I passed that. So I was home waiting for the next shoe to drop. And my dad, unbeknownst to me, went to Liberal, which was our county seat, and went to the draft board and asked them for one year deferment to stay on the farm to help him farm. I did not know this until I got the deferment notice. So, uh, this happened and turned out that this saved my life because I missed the Battle of the Bulge and the Normandy invasion. And one or the other one would, would have got me. And I'm sure because that's what we went over as, as replacements for the soldiers that were killed in these two of big offenses they had. In fact, the uh, squad I joined had one man left from the Battle of the Bulge. They lost all their weapons, and uh, it was a terrible, terrible thing in the winter time and uh, they had to fight in the snow and cold and uh, thank my lord that I was not there. Then uh, when I did get overseas we landed in Marseille, France in a banana boat we call them kind of small, and I can still smell the downstairs where we stayed. Smelled like rotten lettuce. <laughs> and I can still smell that rotten lettuce today. It's terrible. And uh, so we landed in Marseille and took a few days of training. And they issued us new weapons, rifles, pistols, or whatever we needed. And the rifles had been sent over in Cosmoline, which you inventors know what that Cosmoline is. And that's terrible stuff to get off of a weapon. Because it's just like a grease. And this, the barrels were packed full of it. The magazines were packed full of it. And we had to get all that out before we could shoot them on the range. So we did that. Then uh, they got tired of us there and took us over and loaded us on a train. And I don't know if there's any 40 and 8 veterans here belong to 40 and 8. Anyhow, these cars were called 40 and 8. 40 men or 8 horses. And there was about 40 of us in each car. Went from France up to Belgium, and uh, in Belgium, I got up one morning and wasn't feeling very good, and went to to the medic, and he said, "Well, you got the mumps." So there I went back behind the lines to a hospital, and that's where I was when they crossed the Rhine from the west side to the east side. 
the uh, U.S. bombarded the Germans on the other side for 24 hours before they crossed. You can think of all the artillery that was thrown at the Germans. Then uh, we kind of, I think, the uh, general and other officers of our division felt sorry for us because they got beat up so bad in Battle of the Bulge and, and uh, Normandy invasion that they kind of put us in the less, where there's less resistance because we didn't have any real bad battles. In fact, uh, the Germans had started to surrender as we was going east. Here comes a soldier with 50 German soldiers going west. He's taking them back to the uh, detention center. And they was glad to get back there because they just going to have good food. <laughs> they, they laughing and waving at us as we was going the other way. So we did that. Then we got over, ended up on the Ruhr Valley and this house we was on in sat right at the edge of the river valley and it was straight down from there and uh, we got to nosing around and I found some loose floorboards and pulled them up and there were some four roses whiskey <laughs> and uh, other liquor in there. Of course, that didn't last long. <laughs> and we stayed there for a few days. And then they loaded us up and uh, took us over by Dortmund, Germany. And there were three DP camps, which were called Displaced Persons Camp. One was a Russian, one was a Polish, and one was a Czechoslovakia. And we got put on the Russian camp, and uh, we stayed there probably a couple of three months. And then they did, still didn't know what to do with us, so they put us in uh, these big old trucks like a grain truck, and hauled us down into Czechoslovakia and uh, we uh, I don't know if you people remember the strike dock strike in New York when uh, they wasn't getting any food to the soldiers overseas well we was down in Czechoslovakia when that happened I uh, found a little bakery down in this little village just a, a quarter mile from where we stayed and we had a can of you guys remember that good old artificial butter come in 10 and 1 rations that's what we had to eat with that put on that bread so we had bread and butter for several days until the, they got to sending food over again. They got to, in the meantime we were eating uh, farmers turnips. He had about five acres of turnips a little ways from this house we stand in. And we was gorging ourselves on turnips until the captain found out. The farmer told the captain he wanted us to stop eating his turnips. So Captain come and told us and we had to of course stop eating. In the meantime we started getting our food like we were supposed to. We stayed there in Czechoslovakia for a while and one of these grain trucks come again and loaded us up and took us to Nuremberg. I had even heard of Nuremberg and uh, they took us to Nuremberg and put us in this 
building that had this big room, bigger than this room. And there were 35 veterans in, or uh, soldiers in there. <coughs> and the captain came in and said, you guys are going to be escort guards at the Nuremberg trials. That didn't mean a hoot to me. They, uh, uh, that's the first I'd heard of them. In the meantime, they'd been rounding up all these so-called bad people that belonged under Hitler. And they had them in jail there in Nuremberg. And they fixed up this nice core room with walnut paneling and plush carpet and fabulous electronic system that each seat had a set of earphones and a dial that you could dial four different languages. And the interpreters sat at the end of the defendant's box and every word it was said by them or the prosecutors or whoever were repeated by these interpreters. And then went back out into these earphones and that's how it went on for well, I was there eight months. And um, we uh, were called escort guards because that's what we were. We uh, went down every morning and waited for the defendants to get dressed because each night we took their belts and their ties and their shoelaces away from them. Then they had to put those back on in the morning before they went up to court. And then we'd take them through this, take them out of the jail to this tunnel that was about 100 feet long, covered, and to a set of stairs that was about 30 feet up in the air. We had to walk up that, and one guard behind each defendant. And there's an elevator at the top of the stairs that we, I usually had the key, and I don't know why, to the elevator. And I'd take uh, three or four defendants up and a couple of guards and open the door and let them into the defendant's box. And these defendants would go to their seat, and they sat in the same seat every day that the trial was on. And I'd do that until I had all 21 of the defendants in the court. Then uh, we, uh, the ones that escorted the defendants to the courtroom, we stood guard at parade rest behind the defendants. There was about seven of us at a time. And uh, we uh, changed off every two hours on and two hours off. On our time off, we'd be out in the hallway or at the gates where you come in, and you had to have a pass to get through these gates. And we changed the colors on these passes every day. And if you didn't have the right color for the day, you didn't get in. This applied to the judges, everybody. So they were certain that they had the right pass every day. And uh, be kind of hard to turn a judge back. But we would have if we had to. Anyhow, that's uh, where we spent some of our time off. There's almost three gates. We had to check. Uh, everybody for weapons. We had to check women's purses, which was interesting. <laughs> you women carried a lot of things in those purses. <laughs> Even back then, they, it was kind of fun. And because uh, we didn't want any cameras, 
no weapons to come in to that building. One day I was out in the hallway and uh, noticed a captain going into the men's restroom and he had a camera. I thought, well, how did he get in with that camera? So I, w I went into the restroom where he was and asked him and he mumbled something and I said, this is not going to do. So I went out and got the lieutenant and told him about it. So he went in and took the film out of the captain's camera. So he could take pictures right out of uh, the window in the restroom, right at the jail where these prisoners stayed. And that was a no-no. These prisoners, uh, they were, well, they didn't look like it, but they were terrible men. They uh, had done terrible things. They were responsible for terrible things. Of course, Hitler was at the top of the list, and it was what he wanted was to get rid of all the Jews. He didn't care how it was done. He uh, he uh, had several attempts on his life to assassinate him. And he always got out of it some way. He had uh, two trains made up exactly right, alike, same kind of cars and everything, and you couldn't tell one from the other. And nobody knew if he was on this train or that train or none at all. Or he would fly, he had a plane all his own. He might fly. He had these beautiful, big, big uh, cars with open tops. And he's always, he was probably seen pictures of him, always standing up, going to Ohio Hitler. And, uh, and uh, he had several of those, and nobody knew which one he'd be in until he stood up. And then they'd see him. Everybody in Ohio Hitler, you know. He, uh, well, he was something else. Himmler and Goebbels was two of his top bad people. They were responsible for thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish deaths. He, uh, well, he had them do some terrible things. He, uh, for some of these uh, camps, he built 110 camps, concentration camps, in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Germany and all over these places he took over. He had secret documents showing that how they was going to take over the world. And there in Nuremberg they had a huge granite, I suppose, blocks, building blocks. They were curved and they were probably four foot wide, uh, five foot high, and twelve foot long when it was curved. And we had a bunch of those laying out in a field close to where our barracks was. And this was where uh, Hitler was going to rule the world from. I don't know if it's what they did with those blocks, but I know he doesn't have that building. Uh, anyhow, he uh, had Goebbels and Himmler go to these camps and talk to the guards and tell them what they wanted to do. They would uh, go in and pick out a mother just had a baby and take it away from her and uh, 
either throw it in a pit or throw it in a furnace and then wait until they stirred them up. They take pregnant women and tie their legs together so that they know both of them would die. These terrible things, I don't know how they could go home and be with their family and face them after authorizing these things to be done. It was the uh, most horrible thing I'd ever heard of. And uh, they did a, well, I'll go back to the trial. We had uh, two, but three by eight tables in one corner of the courtroom. And on these tables there were bars of soap made from human fat. There were crude looking hammers and pincers and uh, three inch sharp needle pins and he used to drive under fingernails and toenails. They had these uh, grippers that they could grip your toenail and your fingernail and rip them off. They were, I don't know how they lived with themselves, but they, this was done. <laughs> They had uh, hanging pictures of tattooed human skin, beautifully tanned, to hang on your wall. They had purses, billfolds, and uh, other things made from human skin. The better their tattoo was, the better they liked it. And they did those kinds of things. They had a shrunken head about the size of a softball, coal black, and uh, it had to get that shrunken head as small as it was, they had to remove all the bone and keep shaping the head so it looked like a head when they were finished. They had uh, other things I don't remember now. I'm trying to forget some of the worst things I did. So Hitler finally came to Nuremberg. He had a bunker there and had a big courtyard and somebody had dug a grave for Hitler and Eva, his girlfriend. He finally married Eva just before he did away with himself. I have a copy of the marriage certificate and uh, it's not worth anything. <laughs> and a uh, copy of uh, his will. Anyway, when he got to Nuremberg, he had a couple of families, had four kids with him, and he ordered them to, the father of them, to kill the kids and kill his wife and kill himself. And they did it just because he told them to. Then he went up in the courtroom, took Eva with him, stepped down in this grave that was already dug, and he had a pistol. He shot Eva in the temple, stuck the pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. And that was the end. We hear a phrase fairly often, lest we forget. This is a story that is fast, 
fading from our memory because it's been, quote, a long time ago. It is a story that none of us need to forget so that history will not ever, ever repeat itself again. Thank you, Mr. Ross, for your memories you. and for your service to our country. We appreciate that.